And I'm gonna I'm gonna pick it up in um, chapter 23. Um, let's do it in verse 36 here. And let's pray before we start. Father, we just want to, uh, again, come before you and thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you that what we're dealing with here is something that's a revelation that comes straight from heaven. And uh, it's a cool thing to be able to go through it and, and just see awesome things in it. Um, Lord, you make all kinds of predictions, uh, especially in the book of Ezekiel, about what's going to happen in uh, the end times and predictions about specific cities and uh, specific groups of people, and it's a, it's a very cool book, Lord, to be able to go through and, and see that we're dealing with something that is from beyond um, time and beyond space, and uh, it's obviously something that Ezekiel couldn't just pen down by himself. So as we're going through and talking about some of those things, Lord, uh, we just pray that you'd be speaking to our hearts and, again, showing us wondrous things from your law, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Ezekiel chapter 23, verse 36. Uh, wait, okay, there we go. I'm getting my pen going. It says, The Lord also said to me, Son of man, will you judge uh, Ahola and Aholaba? Then declare to them their abominations. For they have committed adultery, and blood is on their hands. They have committed adultery with their idols and even sacrifice their sons whom they bore to me, passing them through the fire to devour them. Moreover, they have done this to me. They have defiled my sanctuary on the same day and profaned my Sabbaths. For after they had slain their children for their idols, on the same day they came into my sanctuary to profane it. And indeed, thus they have done in the midst of my house. Furthermore, you sent for men to come from afar, to whom a messenger was sent, and there they came. And you washed yourself for them, painted your eyes, and adorned yourself with ornaments. You sat on a stately couch with a table prepared before it, on which you set my incense and my oil. The sound of uh, a carefree multitude was with her, and Sabians were brought from the wilderness with men of the common sort, who put bracelets on their wrists and beautiful crowns on their heads. Then I said concerning her who had grown old in adulteries, will they commit harlotry with her now, and she with them? Yet they went into her, as men, in, men go into a woman who plays the harlot, thus they went into Ahola and to Ahola by the lewd women. But righteous men will judge them after the manner of uh, adulteresses and after the manner of women who shed blood because they are adulteresses and blood is on their hands. For thus says the Lord God, bring up an assembly against them, give them up to trouble and plunder. The assembly shall stone them with stones and execute them with their swords. They shall slay their sons and their daughters and burn their houses with fire. Thus I will cause lewdness to cease from the land and uh, that all women may be taught not to practice your lewdness. They shall repay you for your lewdness and you shall pay for your idolatrous sins. Then you shall know that I am the Lord God. Now you remember that uh, at the beginning of this chapter, the whole thing with Ahola and Aholaba had to do, uh, their names that um, literally mean, um, Ahola means her own tabernacle and Aholaba means my tabernacle is in her. And that's the idea of Samaria, uh, specifically the, the capital of the nor northern kingdom of Israel. And then Jerusalem is Aholaba, and that's the southern kingdom of Judah. And you'll remember that Judah, Jerusalem specifically, was the place where the temple was. And we talked about this last week, so I'm not going to go way, way into it. When the two nations split apart, they had basically a civil war just like we did. Um, only they stayed split apart. The northern kingdom um, set up their own religion, basically. And a guy named Jeroboam decided that he was going to set up his own temple. Only it wasn't just one, it was two. One in the far north and one in the far south of his kingdom to make it convenient for people to get to the place where they were going to worship. And they were supposed to worship in Jerusalem. He didn't want them crossing the border and getting, getting connected with Judah because they had seceded from the kingdom, right? And so he does this whole thing, and it's called the sin of Jeroboam. All through kings, uh, you see this, this refrain where the kings of Israel never repented from the sin of Jeroboam. And it was idol worship, calf worship, and just making up your own religion. And so that's what, he's, what um, Ezekiel is talking about when he says, calls Samaria Ahola, her own tabernacle. Aholaba means my tabernacle is in her. You remember the tabernacle was the tent that they would meet in before the temple was built. It's the idea that Jerusalem was the, the place where they, to they were to worship. 
And in the previous section here, God goes through and he talks about the sin of Ahola, Israel, and says it was bad enough. And basically, uh, she committed um, sacra or uh, um, idol worship and she killed her children and that whole thing. And um, then finally, she committed adultery in the sense, she committed adultery in the sense of idol worship. God always considered putting anything before him as adultery. And so idol worship is obviously that. We're supposed to be married to the Lord. Uh, New Testament times, we are the bride of Christ. And so Jesus is like our husband. That's a little easier for my wife to handle than it is for me to handle. But Jesus is like our husband, and you want to be faithful to him. So you don't put any other gods before him, right? Um, And so idol worship was always considered to be adultery with God, right? And so... Old Testament Israel, the northern kingdom, did that. And then on top of it, she committed adultery with the nations. And what that's about is God didn't want Israel making these alliances with the pagan nations that were around them. Specifically, they were never to go back to Egypt, never to be, you know, never to be um, aligned with the Egyptians. And uh, all the alliances that the Israelis made with the nations that were around them always ended up coming back and biting them. As a matter of fact, there's a, there's a period of time uh, in the book of Isaiah where some Babylonian emissaries came from Babylon and came to visit Hezekiah. And when Isaiah found out about it, Isaiah said, what did, who are these men and what did you show them? And Hezekiah said, well, they're emissaries from Babylon and I showed them everything that was in the temple. And Isaiah's like, great, because what's going to happen is all these guys are going to go back to their nation and they're going to come back later on and they're going to take everything that's in the temple because you've done this. And uh, it was a prophecy, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing it, but, but basically the, this whole idea of aligning themselves with the nations was something that God didn't want them doing because he wanted their dependence to be upon him and not upon anything else. And obviously there's some, there's some straightforward correlations in our own lives. I think that a lot of times um, we don't leave room for God to work in our lives because we're so busy planning out and plotting and figuring out how we can get it done on our own. And many times what God wants to do is he just wants to show himself strong on our behalf. And he wants to do the thing and we're not willing to sit back and let him do it. We've got too many plans going on. We've got it in too many ways. And so we got all this stuff going. I've got plan A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, J, you know, all the way down through the alphabet. And I'm asking God to bless all these things. And somewhere around, somewhere around Z is, well, maybe God, you want to do it. And a lot of times what God's doing in our lives is he's knocking out these little plans that we got going and shutting doors on us. And finally we go, well, if, if none of this works, if I, if I can't get it done on my own, all I've got to do is depend on God. You know, which all of heaven goes, oh, look, he got it. <laughs> You know, that, that kind of thing. And, and God considers that, specifically with Israel, adultery. And so, again, um, you, could, you could classify chapter 23 with, um, specifically with Samaria. God going, you like Assyrians? I'm going to give you Assyrians. And they made us alliances with the Assyrians. And in the end, God brought the Assyrians in. And in 722 B.C., the Assyrians took them away. And that's how that ended up. And, got, and these guys, the, the southern kingdom, made alliances with Babylon. And then they didn't like the alliances with Babylon. And so they went back to Egypt. Like, that's better than Babylon. And um, God compares this, again, to adulteries. And he goes, you go from one, you don't like them, and you go to the other, and you don't like them, and none of them are going to be any good for you. And finally, the Babylon, you know, it's like you were all impressed with the Babylonians and their, and their clothing and, and their stature and their nobility and all of that, and I'm going to give you Babylonians, and the Babylonians are going to take you away. And again, it was because God wanted them to be dependent upon him. And one of the problems that you had with Old Testament Israel was they, they wanted to be like the pagan nations that were around them. And it started at the very beginning of their kingdom. Um, there, was a, there was a point where Samuel, it's in the book of 1 Samuel, uh, where they come to Samuel. And Samuel's sons hadn't been following the Lord in the way that Samuel did. And they said, we want a king, just like all the nations around them. And, and Samuel said, God is your king. What are you doing? God's your king. And they said, no, but you know, you're, you're getting old. Your sons are corrupt. And we want a king. 
And Samuel said, okay, you're going to get one, and you're going to get everything that comes with it. And that's when uh, Saul came along and that whole thing. But you can see the heartbrokenness of God and of, of God's representative, Samuel, when the whole thing happened, and it just got worse as time, as time went on. There was a time when God was going to give them a king, but it was supposed to be David, and he was supposed to have a godly heritage, and that didn't last long. There were some good kings in, in Judah, but it, it, all, it ended up in this way. And again, in, when you get down to verse 37, you have this series of indictments that God has against these guys. They've committed adultery, verse 37, blood is on their hands. They've committed adultery with their idols and even sacrificed their sons whom they bore to me, passing them through the fire to devour them. You see the picture that he's given there? It's like he's a husband. Judah is his wife. She bore sons to me and she killed them. And, and again, you got to get that picture because that's the kind of language that he's using there. It would be as if my wife, Bobby, she bore a son to me, Nathan. After she bore Nathan to me, she decided to take him out and sacrifice him and burn him to death. What would this make me think? Would this be a good thing? No, I would be pretty ticked off about the whole thing, right? And that's the, that's the picture that God's giving there. You were, you were my wife and you took my sons, and you killed them. And then he goes on and says, Moreover, they have done this to me. They have defiled my sanctuary on the same day and profaned my Sabbaths. For after they had slain their children for their idols, on the same day they came into my sanctuary to profane it, and indeed, thus they have done in the midst of my house. So it's not only did they do it on the outside of my house, and then come into my sanctuary. They've, li- they've done it in the midst of my house. They've done it in the courtyard of the temple. And expecting that God would be okay with it or at least not do anything about it. Then he goes on and he talks about, so there's adultery with false gods. There's murder and the sacrifice of children. There's hypocrisy in the fact that they would come on the same day that they murdered their children into the temple. And... Um, sin against God. One of, one of the things that you, you, you have with sin, you know, I, I don't know if you do this when, when you're going through passages like this and, and, and just go, okay, what, what is the thinking here? How do you get to this point where you can do this? Because I mean, we've talked about this kind of sacrifice before. Um, what they would do, there was a God named Molech that generally they were doing the sacrificing to. And Molech was basically this iron god, this iron idol that they made. And they would build a fire in front of him. Sometimes the, they would stick his belly out and build a fire in the belly. And his arms would, be, would reach out like this. And what they would do with the children, with the infants specifically, is they would take the, the children and they would put them in the arms of Molech. Their arms are like this. Babies laid across them, the arms are red hot, and the babies would burn to death. And while this is going on, there's all this music playing. It's loud, so you can't hear the screams of the child. And one of the things that happens when somebody burns to death is their skin stretches and melts, right? And so basically, their, their face would melt, and their skin would stretch into a smile. And we have this from some of the histories. And the priest would say, see, there's no pain. The baby's smiling as they burn to death. And they're doing all this stuff. And it comes from the other idol worship that was going on. We've we've talked about that before in this situation. A lot of idol worship, actually almost everything that they did in idol worship had to to do with with sexual immorality. They would literally have um, houses of prostitution in the temples. And your wife or your husband would be involved in this stuff. And when you have uh, sexual sin going on, you're going to get the results of sexual sin. And so many times the women, uh, when they were um, involved in these kinds of rituals, would come back pregnant. Well, if if I'm a guy and my wife has gone down to the local temple of Molech or Baal or Ashtoreth and come back pregnant, I don't want that kid. And so you got to do something to get rid of it. And so this is what they would do. And so you have the product of the, of the idolatry, and you have to get rid of the product of the idolatry, and so what we do is we burn them alive. And there you have it. And God's sitting there watching this whole thing. For years and years 
in years, in years. And then finally he goes, I'm done. And he throws them out of the land at that point. And, uh, you know, again, how do you get there? How do you do that? And, you know, uh, on, on some levels you can, you can see that because, again, my wife has gone out and she's been hanging out at the local, you know, Baal temple, gotten pregnant, and I don't want the kid. Um, it's still hard-hearted. So she, she committed sin, and I allowed it because I'm an idol worshiper too. Um, and I don't want to pay the consequences of that whole thing, which is raising a kid that's not mine. And so what am I going to do with it? I'm going to get rid of it. And, you know, again, you can, you can see some parallels with our culture. We, we just do it cleaner. There's no, you know, smoke rising up from the local Planned Parenthood building, right? And so we, we do it cleaner and we be, do it behind doors and we don't let anybody see what's going on. But it's, it's the same thing. People are worshiping sex and they don't want the consequences of it and, and that whole thing. And, and so this ends up happening. But, you know, it's, again, this whole issue of hard-heartedness. How, do, how does a person get there? And the Bible in, in the New Testament and in the Old Testament compares sin to leprosy. And I don't know if you know about uh, you, you've probably heard about leprosy, but it's a disease. It's call, caused by a bacteria. And what it does is it attacks your nervous system. And, you know, most of what we know about leprosy, um, uh, most of us think of people with parts falling off, you know, their fingers fall off and toes fall off and, and ears and noses and things like that. But many people don't understand why that happens. And the reason it happens is because they lose feeling in their nerve endings. And so, so literally, they can't feel pain anymore. It deadens them. And because they can't feel pain anymore, they're liable to infection. I mean, just think about when you get a, a brand new pair of shoes and they're a little bit tight. Your feet adjust. You adjust your feet and, and the way that you walk in them until, they, uh, un, until they're broken in. And if you didn't do that, you would just rub yourself raw. And that's what happens to lepers. They rub themselves raw in places, and they even, you know, cut themselves. Uh, one, of the, one of the stories I heard about this is, um, uh, came from a book that I read about pain specifically, and actually the blessing that it is to have pain. And it was talking about a kid on, uh, um, was it Molokai? That the, the, I think it was Molokai that the leper colony was on in Hawaii. And so there was a leper colony there back before they, they got the cure to leprosy, and there was a guy who was visiting there, and a little kid came up to him. He couldn't open a door. The, the lock was jammed, and the little kid came up to him and said, you, know, I mean, you, know, you want me to open it for you? And he goes, well, I guess, sure. And the kid just cranks the key over. And he's like, that's amazing. That kid's so strong. Until he turned around and looked at the kid, and he's walking down the aisle, and there's blood dripping from his hand. He didn't even know that he cut himself open. And again, that's, that's what happens. And that's what happens with sin. When, when you sin and you continue to do it and you don't repent of it, you don't turn from it, what happens is you just get deadened to it. Have, have you noticed that? You know, it's like when you, when you first become a Christian, it's like when it, it's one of those things where, where your heart is, is, is soft towards God and everything is a big deal, right? And I think that that's really good because it's the work of God in your heart and he's turning you away from these things and that, that's a great thing. But one of the things that can happen to older Christians or, or even people who grew up in church is they start looking at the sin issue and it's not a big deal to them anymore. And it's, it's weird when you're, when you're an older believer because you can find yourself at certain points putting up with and even embracing things that you never would have embraced or put up with when you were two weeks old in the Lord. And looking at it, and sometimes people look at it and they call it sophistication. Well, maybe it's not sophistication. Maybe it's hardness of heart. Maybe it's not hardness of heart. Maybe it's this deadness of heart. And that's what, that's what sin, sin does. And so when God um, calls us to turn away from sin, part of the reason that he's doing that is because sin separates us from God and it deadens us to the things of God. And you can get yourself in places that you never thought that you'd be. And I've, had, I've heard that refrain over and over in my, in, in my life when, I, when I've been talking to people in counseling. I don't know how I got here. 
I don't know how this happened. This is not how I started. And again, it's, be, it's because of that. And so, you know, um, when, I, when I was first a Christian, I, I thought that you become a Christian and everything changes and there are things that you just don't do and there are things that, that you literally can't do because you're a Christian. I've told you some of that before. You know, I thought, I thought that, that pastors were just like, and you know, the, the guys that were around me as far as pastors were, uh, went, they were godly guys. But I thought that they were practically perfect and, you know, until I saw them doing stuff. And every once in a while, and it wasn't even big stuff. You know, just getting irritated at something or getting irritated at somebody. I was like, he got irritated. That's, that's shocking. I thought, I thought Christians were all loving and kind at all times. And, you know, and it's not that even irritation can't be biblical and stuff. But you, I, w- I was really naive as a young Christian. I thought it's like, boom, Jesus comes into your life and everything changes. And it just gets better and better. I, I've, I've told you about marriage counseling. Uh, when I did pre-marriage counseling uh, with my wife, you know, uh, my, one of the pastors was talking about having arguments after you got married. And I was like, well, we're never going to have an argument. And he goes, what are you talking about? We're Christians. You know? <laughs> and I was serious. I can still remember sitting there in that room. And he, st- he started laughing at me. <laughs> he was a friend of mine. He started laughing at me and and I'm like, Fred, what are you laughing at? <laughs> I, was, I, mean, I, I felt kind of, I didn't feel kind of, well, I was just clueless because I really thought that it wasn't going to be like that. I mean, you know, Bobby and I had never had an argument at all. We had a disagreement one time, you know, and, and it was like we'd been dating for a year and never had a problem. And then I got married and all of a sudden the real woman came out. <laughs> And she'd been raised with nothing but sisters, and so she had a real shock coming. <laughs> but again, you know, it, it, it's like we need, we need to be people who um, have, that, have that kind of pure heart thing going on where I, I don't want to be in a situation where I get older in the Lord and I look at things that were junk when I was first a Christian and now I'm okay with them. And, I, you know, I, we, we just don't want to be like that. And so there, there's a deadness of heart there. And then it talks about the Sabians. It goes on and talks about, you know, you've sent for men to come from afar and that whole thing. And in verse 42, it says, the sound of a carefree multitude was with her and Sabians were brought from the wilderness with men of the common sort who put bracelets on their wrists and beautiful crowns on their heads. And the Sabians were a, a group of people. They were a group of nomadic people. But the word Sabian also means drunkards. And so it's this picture of, of a woman who's idolatrous and adulterous and a murderess and hangs with drunkards while she's on her couch. You know, it's like, it's a soap opera. It's, it's that whole thing. And um, God just goes, these are the reasons. You're gone. And I'm finished with this. And obviously, um, he's talking about the nation. He's not, he's not just talking about ladies. Verse 44, um, yet they went into her as men go into a woman who plays the harlot. Thus they went into Ahola and Aholaba, the lewd women. Then verse 45, he says, but righteous men will judge them after the manner of adulteresses and after the manner of women who shed blood because they are adulteresses and blood is on their hands. And the righteous men that he's probably speaking about there are the prophets. So God, God would send prophets to the people of Israel and tell them to turn and repent. And unfortunately for those people, they never listened. Um, and then he talks about the judgment that comes upon them because of that. Verse 47, the assembly shall stone them with stones and execute them with their swords. They shall slay their sons and their daughters and burn their houses with fire. Thus I will cause lewdness to cease from the land that all women, and if Ahola and Aholaba are the capitals of these nations then all women would be other nations, right? Uh, Capitals of other nations. Thus I will cause lewdness to cease from the land that all women may be taught not to practice your lewdness. They shall repay you for your lewdness and you shall pay for your idolatrous sins. Then you shall know that I am the Lord Lord God. And so what God's saying there is that he's going to make the nation of of Israel and make, make the nation of Judah 
an example literally to the pagan nations of people who are adulterous and lewd and who should not have turned away from their God. That's exactly what God says in the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 28 through 30 is a, is a great passage to read on this whole issue because before they even get into the land, God tells them their history and tells them what's going to happen and tells them that because of their unfaithfulness to him, he's going to make them an example to the nations who are around them. And the example goes like this. You serve me, you follow me, then people are going to ask, ask, why are they so blessed? And the passage says that they're blessed because they follow the Lord their God and they serve him and they're faithful to him. And I'm, again, I'm paraphrasing, but this is in Ezekiel 28. It's verse 14 verses of blessings for the people of Israel if they will follow the Lord. And then there's another 44 verses of cursings and he, what he says is, if you don't follow me, if you don't keep my commandments, if you don't do the things that I've called you to, then what's going to happen is you're going to be cursed in the city. You're going to be cursed in the field. You're going to be cursed when you rise up. You're going to be cursed when you lay down. You know, curse, 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 curse. And he goes through and lists all the things that are going to happen to them. And at the end of the whole thing, he's going to, he says that there are going to be people who pass by, other nations that pass by and say, why has this devastation come upon this land? Why has this been done to the people of Israel? And it's because they're, they've turned away from the Lord, their God. And so basically what God said is, you're going to be a witness. You're going to be a witness to me. You're going to be somebody who speaks to the nations who are around you about the fact that I am really there and I am real. And you're either going to be a witness to me because of the blessing that I give you, because of your, your following of me, or you're going to be a witness to me of the cursing that comes down upon you because you refuse to follow me. And that's what the nation of Israel was supposed to be. You know, um, in the New Testament, Jesus calls us, us a city set on a hill and talks about the fact that the, we're the light of the world and that you don't take it and put it under a basket and that, that whole thing. We're to be a witness for Christ. And that's what Israel was supposed to be in the Old Testament as far as the nation goes. And they were. They were a good one or they were a bad one. And either way, God, it was evident that God was in their lives. Now the, now the passage there that you see in uh, Deuteronomy 28 and 29 where it talks about those things, those are specifically to Israel. You can't take those and cross them over and make them the church because the church is never going to turn away from Jesus, right? Individuals can, but the church itself can't. Okay? Because the church is just all real believers in Christ. And what happens is God comes into our lives and he's got this whole thing with the church. And yeah, there, there are people who come in and pretend to be part of the church and they leave. And so you have that whole thing going on. There are maybe, maybe even, even issues where people were genuine about the whole thing and they walk off and you've got that whole thing. But what God has said about the church is that it's going to continue until he comes back and the church is going to be taken out. You see what I mean? And so what I'm saying to you is the church is not Israel. You can't do a straight line correlation as far as that whole thing goes. But if I follow the Lord, my life is blessed. If I do the things that God calls me to do, my, my life is radically different than what it was in the world. And, you know, this is just practical righteousness. If I'm, if I'm doing the things that God has called me to do sexually, and if my family is following Jesus, I'm never getting AIDS. I'm never getting a sexually transmitted disease. I understand that there's some ways that you can get it otherwise, but you know, for the most part, none of that junk happens to me. None of it happens to me, right? And if I am godly in business dealings, then the government's not gonna come down on me. I'm not gonna have the you know, lo local prosecutor come after me and put me in jail. If I am not a drunkard, I'm not going to run into anybody and kill their family, right? And all the stuff that comes along with that. If I'm not a drunkard, then, you know, I'm not going to be wrecking my family, right? And, you know, you can, um, if, if I'm not a liar, then I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to be getting respect that most people in the world don't get. Because most of the people in the world tell lies. If I, you know, if I, I'm, I'm never going to be not a sinner, but if I sin and I apologize to people, my life is going to be way different than if I sin and try to make my stand and pretend that I didn't and fight to the death, you know, over things, you know, all the stuff that the world does, 
right? My life is going to be absolutely different. If I, if I do the things that the Bible says I'm supposed to be doing with my kids, then not only is my life going to be different, but the life of my children is going to be different. And what, I, what I'm saying to you is that I think that a lot of times, again, I think that a lot of times people think that God is cursing them on issues. And actually, many of the blessings that we get from being a Christian is just turning away from the world and not getting the consequences that the world gets. That's, that's it. And so there, there are times when God is actively blessing me, and I know that he is. And he, and he does things in my life, and he puts me in right positions, and he works in my life, and, and that kind of thing. So I'm not minimizing that whole thing. But really, really, most of the blessing I have in my life is because I excised the garbage that I had in the world and took it away. I just, I just turned away from it. And that's why you have commandments in Scripture. God's not trying to wreck my fun. He's, he's trying to bless my life. And, you know, here, here I am, you know, what, uh, 30, uh, what is it, 36 years. 36 years a Christian and got all that history at this point. And really, that's, that's what it is. So some of, you, some of you guys are younger and you're, you're making decisions and you're going, man, this is hard. And this is, you know, I got to, you know, I know I'm supposed to be doing what God says, but it's like, I don't really see the benefit. And I don't, I, I don't really, you know, why is he like this in this area? Why is he like that in that area? The, you know, sometimes this is really hard to make these kinds of stands. And I'm telling you from my perspective that I have been, you know, I've had to make those kinds of stands and I have been radically blessed just because I didn't go with the world. I didn't go the same way that they went and get all the same junk that they got. I, didn't have, I don't have the same consequences that they've got. And my life is blessed because of it. And that's why God says these things. That's why, that's why he talks to people in this way. That's why he spoke to the nation of Israel. And, you know, as, uh, as far as uh, uh, the church goes, you know, you can, you can be a Christian and still have a life that's a train wreck because you will not obey. And it doesn't have to be in every area. You can be a Christian and still have your life be a, pre, a train wreck because, um, l- let's just pick one, you're lustful and you won't repent. And in every other area of your life, you're doing your best to, to get things right with the Lord and that kind of stuff, but you, you know, you've got this area in your life that you just don't want to deal with. Or you can be a Christian and you're prideful and you won't stop it. And every other area of your life Kind of. You know, obviously, these things spill over. But every other area of your life can be going great. But in this one area, you will not stop it. And you are going to get consequences from that. And your life can be a train wreck because of that. If you run into people whose lives are train wrecks, and you know that they love Jesus, and they're following him, I can, I can guarantee you that when you, go, when you examine that lifestyle, examine what's going on with them, they got stuff that's happening that they just will not give over to the Lord. And God doesn't promise to bless my flesh. And he doesn't promise to bless my disobedience. He doesn't promise that. What he, do, what he does is he promises to forgive me when I repent of those things. And he promises to give me the power to live differently and to turn away from that stuff. And so many times, you know, obviously, we had a situation where as Christians, there has to be a turning away. There has to be a turning away from the world and a turning towards God. And when you do that, man, God can just do awesome things in your life and, and, and life is just different. doesn't mean it's going to be perfect because there's spillover from other people. Some, sometimes your husband will not repent. For example, sometimes your children will not repent and there's spillover from that. I understand that. Um, but man, I like being a Christian. <laughs> I just like what, what, God, what God's done with me and, and it has to do with just having a right heart towards him. So let's stop right there. Finished a chapter. Yeah. I wanted to get to chapter 26 so bad, but that's okay. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these people and um, hearts that are turned towards you. And uh, Lord, uh, people with a, with a desire to follow you and to do the things that you've called them to. And Lord, um, you talk, when you were actually, when you were talking to Eli, in his disobedience, you said that God honors those who honor him. And Father, I just pray that you'd make each one here somebody who honors you 
and honors you in all aspects of their lives, Lord. Does their best to do the things that you would have them do and has open hearts um, to the voice of your spirit and uh, a willingness just to turn and to be like you. God, in those areas where we fall short of that, we pray that you make it clear. And uh, Lord, that you give us repentant hearts and uh, help us to be people who are willing to turn. And I just ask that you do this all in Jesus' name. Bless these people. We ask it in your name. Amen.